So he's going to be more or less here. Right about here, yeah. Excellent. To be right about here, right where my audience is looking at me now. Hey there. I'm actually being of help. For once, I'm not in the way. Or am I now? Okay. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. We're coming to you live from the campus of North Central State College in Shelby, Ohio, where today we will be receiving a major announcement in the missing persons case of Mary Jane Van Gilder a native of West Virginian who, in case you forget, went to missing from Northern Ohio in March of 1945, I believe nearly 80 years ago. This morning, you will be hearing from Detective Adam Turner, who will be bringing you up to speed on exactly where things stand now. Uh, if you were with us for our live broadcast two months ago from Preble County, you know, we had some audio problems. Uh, hopefully, hopefully we have got those resolved this time. The camera is much, much closer. And uh, we actually have a microphone system hooked up this time. Once again, for those of you who are viewing and watching this live, um, I have no control once we get started here over the camera or the sound or anything else because I'm off operating about three other cameras and two other microphones to bring you an augmented version of this a few weeks from now. So if the feed goes out, if the audio goes out, uh, I have no way of monitoring it and I have no way of answering chats while this is going on. So what you see and what you hear is what you get. And with that, I'm gonna step back into the background and thank you for tuning in. We can see you, we can hear you. We're kind of looking up your nose. Okay. No, I got I gotta I gotta read anyway. <laughs> Other than that, the sound is fine according to my viewers. Okay. okay. <clears throat>
Testing. There we go. Ready? Ready? Uh, good morning. Welcome to the Kehoe Center at uh, North Central State College. Um, today we're here to discuss the five and a half year investigation into the 1945 disappearance of Mary Jane Croft Van Gilder. Uh, before I start, uh, I was told that the college is doing some construction work, a couple, couple doors down, so if you hear like a loud bang, um, that's what it is. My name is Adam J. Turner. I'm a detective for the city of Shelby. Uh, for those of you watching remotely, Shelby is in Richland County, about 10 miles to the northwest of Mansfield. Mansfield would be um, the midpoint on an imaginary line between Cleveland and Columbus. Uh, because this case began in 1945, I do have a lot to tell you. And because it took a vast amount of people to get where we are today, I have a lot of people to thank all of whom were instrumental in getting to the resolution that we did. If you have any questions, please hold them till the end and I will do my best to answer them. Um, I started with the Shelby Police Department in 2007. Uh, in 2012, um, I began working for the Springfield, Ohio Police Department until 2016 uh, when I became an enforcement investigator for the State Medical Board of Ohio. In 2018, I returned to the Shelby Police Department. Um, I'm assigned to the Detective Bureau, where I investigate the gamut of criminal cases, both at the misdemeanor and felony level. I earned my bachelor's degree in criminal justice from the University of Toledo, and I earned a master's degree in criminal justice and forensic science from St. Leo University. So how did all of this start? How did we get here? So in October of 2018, uh, the Shelby Police Department received a message from Mindy Wilson, who reported that her maternal grandmother, Mary Jane Croft Van Gilder, born November 19th of 1911, was missing and was last seen in Shelby in 1945. On October 10th, 2018, I officially opened Case number 18-22120. To date, I've generated 107 supplemental reports spanning thousands of pages. Uh, Mary Jane was married to James Wesley Van Gilder. Um, they married on January 26, 1929 in Marion County, West Virginia. Between them, they had seven children. Uh, Anna May Van Gilder, James Ray Van Gilder, Martha Louise Van Gilder, Barbara Darlene Van Gilder, Cheryl or Judy Van Gilder, and then two twins, Alan Eugene Van Gilder and Alice Jones Van Gilder, who unfortunately uh, died at birth. So Mary Jane, like I said, was originally from Fairmont, West Virginia, but she had moved in Ohio um, in March 1944. Uh, it's about 253.9 miles, and it takes about four hours and 50 minutes to get uh, from here to Fairmont. Mary Jane came to work um, at the Wilkins Army Air Force, Air Force Depot in Shelby. Uh, the Wilkins Army Air Force uh, Depot opened in 1943. And it was 60 acres of storage space, which uh, distributed more than 40,000 different parts before it was decommissioned by the government in 1961. Today, the former Wilkins Army Air Force Depot is now the Central Ohio Industrial Park. Mary Jane lived in Willard and in Plymouth, Ohio, uh, both of which are in Huron County. Uh, which is directly to the north of Richland County, if you're watching remotely. She lived at uh, 2 Truck Street, and you can see I have an arrow there. Um, that's the one on the far left. Um, that building has since been raised within uh, the last couple of years. Um, she also lived at 19 Sandusky Street, 
and that is in the middle here with the red arrow. Um, it's also raised. Uh, the building on the left um, is the People's National Bank, and that'll come into play um, later, but they were right next door to each other. And she lived at uh, 311 Woodland Avenue um, in Willard. Um, that's the only residence that she lived in that uh, still stands. Um, after the first disclosure of Mary Jane's former addresses, I, re I received a tip uh, that there was some paranormal activity at one of them and requested that I excavate the basement for human remains. Um, this was not conducted uh, due to no other linking information. I searched through our old police files and was unable to locate any investigation or mention of Mary Jane Croft Van Gilder. Shelby Police Chief Lance Combs contacted the Plymouth Police Department who affirmed that they investigated the case briefly in 2004 after being contacted by Mindy's sister, Misty Griner. An article was run in the Plymouth Journal in December of 2004, giving an overview of Mary Jane's disappearance and if anyone remembered her to contact Misty. I know it's kind of hard to see, but that's the letter that she received back. Um, she received a letter in January of 2005 um, from William H. King. Uh, Mr. King stated that his father, J.S. King, and his two brothers worked at the Shelby Depot. He stated she, Mary Jane, would ride to and from work with them. She became good friends with the family and would come to visit often. He said, I remember that the winter of 1943 and 1944, it came a very bad snowstorm during one day. The community office at the depot did not release the workers in time to make it home. The roads were drifted shut and almost impassable. A whole line of cars pushed and shoveled their way until about two miles from Plymouth when they could get no further. So everyone started the walk. I remember my father talking different times about this. Mary Jane was so cold she wanted to sit down and get warm, but dad and the other people would not let her and helped her walk. I think Dad said she only had on dress shoes and her feet must have been almost frozen. I'm sorry to say that we lost contact with your grandma after the depot laid off so many workers and we never saw or heard from her again until the story in the paper. That's Mr. King um, down there, bottom right hand corner. He unfortunately passed away in March 2019. As a result, um, from inquiries from the Van Gilder family, a Jane Doe found on May 10th, 1950 in Berkeley County, West Virginia, was exhumed in 2007. This Jane Doe had similar physical characteristics to Mary Jane. DNA was extracted from this Jane Doe, but it was ultimately excluded as me being Mary Jane. This Jane Doe remains unidentified today. Prior to everything in the late 1940s and 1950s, uh, Mary Jane's eldest daughter, Anna Mae Rayer, had written letters um, to the Marion County, West Virginia Sheriff, who in turn wrote letters to the Plymouth Police asking for assistance, as well as the Treasury Department. Mary Jane had been sending her daughter war bonds. However, in January of 1945, Mary Jane wrote Anna Mae and requested that she send all of the war bonds back. This was the last letter of contact anyone had with her. After Anna Mae sent her mother the bonds, she received one in late January, 1945. That $25 war bond was issued to Mary Jane Van Gilder and was cashed at the People's Bank in Plymouth. Those are just some letters that Anna Mae um, wrote. Now, she also wrote letters to the Wilkins Army Air Force Depot in 1952, asking about the whereabouts of her mother. Uh, she received a letter in return stating that her mother resigned employment on March 8, 1945, citing added household duties. Anna Mae also wrote to the FBI to request assistance, and she would always 
generally see the same response, that no trace of her mother could be located and the federal government would not assist in local law enforcement efforts. <coughs> Under 1952, the Zippo, um, here's a letter that she, Anna May, had wrote to the FBI. Um, you see down there, it's uh, John Edgar Hoover um, in his signature there. Um, she also wrote letters to the, the Baltimore Police Department because there was a tip that uh, Mary Jane might have been in the Baltimore area. And then there's an additional one um, to the FBI. <coughs> Um, Mary Jane filed for divorce from James in Huron County Court of Common Pleas on the 12th day of February 1945, exactly 79 years ago today. It was withdrawn by her attorney on April 4th, 1946, because Mary Jane did not show up to court. Uh, James Van Gilder filed for divorce from Mary Jane in Marion County, West Virginia. It was branded on November 26th of 1945. James remarried Virginia Cowder in 1946. He raised his children that he had with Mary Jane into adulthood. James unfortunately died on December 12th, 1985. Uh, from the beginning, I wanted to publicize of my investigation into uh, Mary Jane's disappearance uh, because I valued uh, public input and assistance. Uh, I was fortunate enough uh, to do several podcasts on her case, as well as be featured um, in numerous law, uh, newspaper articles written by the Mansfield News Journal. A special uh, thanks to Zach Tuggle, Lou Whitmer, and especially Mark Codill uh, for documenting this case. Also, thank you to Brittany Schock of the Richland Source uh, for doing an article. This philosophy of transparency would prove to be very beneficial in coming to the resolution that we did. Um, following podcasts did stories on Mary Jane, and I want to publicly recognize them. Uh, Missing Persons podcast uh, by Mike Morford, Unfound by Ed Denzel, The Trail of Cold by Robin Warder. Mysterious WV by Sean McCracken, who is down here in the front. Um, Ohio Mysteries, Paul Schleiss, uh, Missing in Ohio, Kelly Bruce, and Lord and Arts, John Borden. Um, I knew that Mary Jane's military file could be located. If it could be located, it could contain some useful information. I incorrectly assumed that her file had been destroyed years before um, at the National Personal Records Center in Overland, Maryland uh, in 1973. Uh, through my investigation and because several podcasts I've done previously, I was contacted and informed that while Army, Army Air Force records for sworn military members during that time were almost destroyed in a fire, that civilian records from the time were located elsewhere and not burnt in a fire. Through a records request to the National Archives, I was able to locate Mary Jane's military service file and letters that Anna May wrote in the 1940s and 1950s to the FBI. This was a huge lead that would be pivotal to the investigation. While I wasn't able to obtain her social security number of 234-320125, something we did not have before. Um, there were, there was no, um, there was nothing to indicate where Mary Jane might have gone after she left her employment in 1945. So all attempts to track the activity on her social security number through federal law enforcement processes showed no activity after 1945. Early on in the investigation, I received information that Mary Jane's disappearance could be related to other Ohio missing persons cases, although there was, although there was little to no evidence to support this. Uh, Ruth Baumgartner, missing since May 4th, 1937, from Delaware, Ohio. Wool Selly, missing since February 23rd, 1946, from Grandview Heights, Ohio and Bertha Tid Newell, missing since July 13, 1948, from Zanesville, Ohio, 
all of these women still remain unidentified. I was told that Mary Jane uh, could be buried on some land in West Virginia um, and that we were to search um, the house that Mary Jane James lived in prior to her coming to Ohio. As you can see, uh, the area is extremely dense and wooded, which would make a ground search uh, very, very difficult. The home that the Van Goders lived in burnt to the ground in 1986, taking with it any remaining possessions of Mary Jane. With the knowledge that there are tens of thousands of Jane Doe's and John Doe's in the United States alone, and theorizing that Mary Jane could possibly be a Jane Doe buried somewhere in this country, I searched NamUs, which is the National Missing and Unidentified Persons System. NamUs is a database of many of the missing and unidentified people throughout the nation. This system allows law enforcement, coroner's offices, and the general public to potentially match Jane and John Doe's to reported missing people. Using parameters specific to Mary Jane, I searched Jane Doe's found after 1945 while using her physical characteristics. I included the possibility that Mary Jane lived after 1945 and then became a missing person, became an unidentified person later in life. In the name of system alone, uh, there were cases that piqued my interest as uh, the unidentified person had similar physical traits as Mary Jane and the circumstances uh, surrounding the discovery of the unidentified person could be a candidate for Mary Jane Van Goder. I then would reach out to coroner's offices or police departments who oversaw the case. Unfortunately, a lot of these departments were not open to the possibility of doing an exhumation uh, for DNA purposes. Some scoffed at the idea of working a 1945 missing persons investigation, while others would simply not return my emails or phone call. This is a partial list of unidentified remains that I requested further information about. Unfortunately, all of these remain unidentified. Early candidates um, for potential DNA extraction based on similar physical characteristics or circumstance were um, Jane Doe uh, on the left there, found November 14, 1969 uh, in Lake Erie near East 9th Street and Erie Side Ave, who had drowned. This Jane Doe's location uh, in the Cleveland Potter's Field was established. However, the Cuyahoga County Coroner's Office refused requests um, for an exhumation from myself as well as Mary Jane's family. Number two, in the middle, an unidentified female found in Safety Harbor, Florida on March 4, 1961, uh, an apparent homicide victim. And although this unknown uh, decedent's remains were sent for DNA testing through the FBI, no sample has been identified or usable. Now, number three, an unknown female found in Oak Grove, Oregon on April 13, 1946. Um, dismembered and floating in the Clackamas River. However, the remains and evidence that could be used for DNA purposes have been misplaced by law enforcement over time. All remain unidentified. Uh, because NamUs is not a completely comprehensive system, I searched to find a grave located a newspaper article uh, showing that an unidentified female had been found stuffed in a box in a cornfield on October 8, 1976, in Benton County, Indiana. With an estimated age of 55 to 65, Mary Jane would have been 65 years of age. I contacted coroner Matt Rosenbarger, who stated that he was familiar with the case and always wanted to identify this unknown victim. In July of 2019, Benton County officials exhumed this DNA for exhumed this Jane Doe for DNA extraction and cited my query into the case as motivation to do so. Uh, DNA testing is still ongoing through the DNA Doe project. Again, using Find a Grave, I lo located an article from 1968 indicating that a Jane Doe had been found in Eaton, Ohio, Preble County, 
on May 25, 1968, in a drainage ditch after a strong rain by children Brian and Bruce McFall. This Jane Doe was not listed in NamUs, but according to the article, the Jane Doe was a Caucasian, 5'2 to 5'4 in height, and estimated to be around 40 years old. A dental plate found near the body was estimated to be 10 to 15 years old, which would put the date of death between 1953 and 1958. Between 1953 and 1958, Mary Jane would have been between the ages of 42 and 47. Theorizing that Mary Jane might have moved uh, to the area to be close to Wright Patterson uh, Air Force Base, then still called uh, Wright Field and Patterson Field, I reached out to the Preble County Coroner's Office and was put in contact with Coroner's Investigator Dave Linlaw, who, along with Eaton City, the city of Eaton, and cemetery officials organized an exhumation on this unidentified person. On August 28th, 2019, I traveled to Mound Hill uh, Cemetery in Eaton for the exhumation of the Preble County Doe. Uh, the, day, uh, the grave was dug um, via backhoe and then hand tools. Uh, the Jane Doe was located inside the vault, uh, which was underneath a layer of silt and sediment. The original casket had completely disintegrated since the four metal handles. Pyro BCI arrived and took custody of the skeletal remains. BCI was eventually able to determine that this unknown person was not Mary Jane Van Gilder. After several years of failed DNA extractions and sequencing, in June 2022, the Shelby Police Department partnered with Moxie Forensic Investigations to complete investigative genetic genealogy. 2023, it was determined that the body was not that of an unknown female, but an unknown male. That male was subsequently identified as Albert Allen Frost. Uh, Albert was in uh, the military. He was an Army veteran, originally from Hamilton, Ohio, who disappeared between 1963 and 1964. He was never officially reported as a missing person. However, surviving family members, recollections, and newspaper articles helped pinpoint the years he disappeared. Albert will now receive a proper marker at the cemetery, and his family will have some semblance of closure on what happened to him. Um, if you're interested in knowing more about this case, my press conference and announcement can be easily found on the internet. Um, which will provide further details. In early 2019, I located an article on findagrave.com indicating that a skeleton of Jane Doe had been found in Porter County, Indiana in November of 1945 in a wooded area. The cause of death was undetermined. However, uh, she was estimated to be between 30 and 45 years of age. Mary Jane would have been 33 in 1945. After contacting Coroner Cindy Dykes about the possibility of an exhumation, Coroner Dykes, along with Township Trustee Jan Myers, uh, utilized ground penetrating radar in Carter Cemetery, Chesterton, Indiana, to pinpoint the area the Jane Doe was located. Uh, Coroner Dykes and Ms. Myers made all the provisions for exhumation possible. And Jan and her husband came from uh, Indiana today. I'm, I'm so happy to see you guys. Thanks for coming. On September 23rd, 2021, I traveled to Chesterton, Indiana for the exhumation of Porter County Jane Doe. Dr. Krista Latham and her team from the University of Indianapolis, uh, the Center for Human Identification, conducted the dig. For the majority of the first day, no grave was located. However, by the end of the day, an unidentified body was found. On September 24th, several bones from the unidentified female were removed. These bones were very deteriorated. And then, unfortunately, dentures were found in the mouth of this female, um, which kind of precluded it being the original person that we were doing the exhumation on because that person had gold teeth. 
Nonetheless, this was also an unidentified person. Uh, DNA testing is currently ongoing through the DNA Go project. Um, on March 7, 2021, I located a new entry in the NamUs system showing that an unidentified female had been found in Cassian, Wisconsin in 1947, the victim of an apparent homicide. She was estimated to be 5'2", 170 pounds with brown hair. I contacted the medical examiner, Crystal Schaub, who stated that they discovered this Jane Doe's file after cleaning out an old basement. All they located were four pictures of the deceased and the crime scene. Coroner Schaub stated that she contacted local funeral homes and was able to find a little more about the Jane Doe, but not much. After I sent Coroner Schaub pictures of Mary Jane and articles previously written about the case, she believed that the pictures of Mary Jane and this Jane Doe looked similar. She stated that she was considering an exhumation, but my inquiry propelled her to move forward on doing so. On October 5th of 2021, I flew to Wisconsin, where I met with Dr. Schaub and coroner's investigator Luke Johnson. Upon arrival at the cemetery, the FBI evidence response team from Milwaukee was present and conducted the extraction from the ground. A backhoe was brought in and after several scoops, two human bones were discernible at the bottom of the grave. Digging with the backhoe ceased and we moved on to hand tools. Ground that had been lifted via backhoe was then sifted through several sifting stations. Numerous bones and pieces of fiber were removed through the sifting process. The bones that were uncovered via the backhoe were determined to be arm bones. A mostly complete skeleton was found about four feet into the earth. The skull was fragmented, and since the DNA, since the Jane Doe wore dentures, no teeth were present. Long bones from the arms and legs were recovered as well as, as, well as digits from the hands and feet. All skeletal remains were secured by the FBI, taken back to Milwaukee, where they were undergo DNA testing. Because of uh, media coverage surrounding these exhumations, uh, specifically an article in the Akron Beacon Journal written by Paula Schleiss, uh, I was contacted for advice concerning the possibility of doing an exhumation regarding the 1994 double homicide at the Berlin Reservoir in Portage County, the murders of Catherine Menendez and Sarah Bain. That investigation remains active and ongoing. I also received a call from Levi Cabler from the Williams County, North Dakota Sheriff's Office, stating that he had an unidentified body in 1982. After seeing the coverage of the exhumations that we did, it propelled him to exhume this male. This male was subsequently identified as Philip Peterson. Also because of those articles, I received a call from the Erie County Prosecutor's Office for advice about conducting an exhumation on a Jane Doe found in 1980 floating in Lake Erie. This female was eventually exhumed in 2021 and was identified as Patricia Greenwood by the Porsche White Project. During my search for unidentified remains that could be Mary Jane, uh, I came across an article on finding a grave about a Jane Doe found in Rankin County, Mississippi in 1978. Now, although this unidentified female's age range excluded the possibility that this could be Mary Jane, I contacted the Rankin County Coroner's Office and advised them that this was a Jane Doe that was not in NamUs. Because of my phone call, the Jane Doe was resumed in 2021. She was identified as Tanya Lee Willis Mullins in March 2023 by Akron. Uh, multiple Jane Doe's were excluded throughout this investigation as not being Mary Jane. Um, starting on the left, up the top, a Jane Doe found in the Collier County, Florida on J June 3rd, 1978. A Jane Doe found in Denver, Colorado on February 3rd, 1983, which was later identified as Hope Waddle. A Jane Doe found in War New York on April 16th, 1972. A Jane Doe found in Norman, Oklahoma on April 16, 1981. 
uh, Jane Doe found in Los Angeles County on, on April 15, 1958. Uh, Jane Doe found in Riverside, California on October 24, 1994, who in 2022 was identified as Patricia Cavallaro. And Jane Doe found in Lower Township, Pennsylvania on February 9, 1979. And lastly, a, a Jane Doe found in Lakewood, Florida on April 15, 1961. I received uh, several tips that Mary Jane could possibly be a Jane Doe found in Vernon County, Wisconsin in 1984. However, this female was excluded um, by DNA. Uh, DNA testing is currently ongoing with the DNA Doe project. Uh, that's uh, an estimation there on the left. Another uh, Jane Doe I received several phone calls and emails on uh, was a female found murdered in Grand Bay, Alabama in 1976. It was determined that this Jane Doe had been cremated decades before. Um, this Jane Doe was eventually excluded after Olivia and Carter of the Mobile County Sheriff's Office sent off a dental mode cast at the time for possible DNA. She has subsequently been identified as Ada Elizabeth Fritz by Moxie Forensic Investigations. I received multiple tips that Mary Jane could be a Jane Doe uh, found in Canada. Um, the first one was found in 20, 2011, I'm sorry, 2001, and nicknamed Madame Victoria. The second was a female found in a cement floor in 1995, but the concrete was poured in 1949. Both uh, were excluded by DNA. Uh, these articles, uh, detailed unidentified remains found in Ohio that are not in NamUs. The first one is an unidentified body found in the Ohio River near Portsmouth in 1952. The second talks about a skeleton found near Columbus in 1949, originally thought to be Lola Sellies, who I, I mentioned previously. The third talks about an unidentified body found in Medina County in 1949. And the fourth details a body found near Dauphin, Pennsylvania in 1949. Unfortunately, this systematic tragedy has been called the nation's silent mass disaster. People buried without names. I was told early on in my investigation that Mary Jane's sister, Rose Croft, was also missing. I found through my research that Rose married Harold Leeson on July 7, 1934. They had three children, Robert, Claude, and Shirley. In the 1940 census, Rose was still living in Winfield, West Virginia. I was told through family members that a letter was received by one of Rose's children at some point after 1940, stating that their mother was hospitalized or in some kind of facility. This letter no longer exists, and they couldn't remember exactly what state the letter was from, but believed it was possibly New York known what type of facility Rose was in, uh, but I included the possibility that Rose could have been institutionalized. Uh, when I received Mary Jane's military file, uh, which is where the red arrows are pointing, she listed her sister's name as Rose Ashcraft. This was the first time that anyone heard the name Ashcraft, and it's unknown where that originated. Using the name Rosie Ashcraft, I located a marriage certificate from December 14, 1953, showing that Rose married James Reed Cherry in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and it is unknown what happened to Rose after 1953. If you followed my press conference about Albert Frost, you will remember that he too had a sister that was missing, Clara Frost from Cleveland, Ohio, a strange similarity between the cases. When I was doing the, my master's degree, I read this book um, called Cold, Cold Case Research uh, by Sylvia Pettum. Uh, Ms. Pettum discusses the importance of use, utilizing civilian help. I'm going to read what she, what she says directly. She says, volunteers can provide different perspectives. If a cold case person is taken off the shelf, a fresh set, a fresh set of eyes may discover inconsistencies in the investigation or gaps in the documentation. 
Additionally, volunteers had the time to do background work, such as arranging case files or making spreadsheets of family members, which frees up detectives from busy work. Volunteers can sometimes offer specific skill sets, such as web design, historical or genealogical research, or software expertise. Many of these volunteers are willing to work for free. Uh, some may be working towards a new career, while others are fulfilling a specific interest or simply want to give back to their community. I took this philosophy to heart and mentioned it in the beginning of this investigation in several of the podcasts I did. Uh, that I would listen to public thoughts or sentiment and be completely transparent in what I was doing. This philosophy did not come with, without different perspectives. I was contacted by numerous private investigators, most wanting money to assist me with my investigation. I was also contacted by several psychics. And while I believe there is more to this life uh, than the physical realm, I didn't receive any credible tips or relative tips. I was contacted in 2020 by a psychic who stated that Mary Jane was buried at a construction site, which was now a restaurant, and that Mary Jane was killed because she was pregnant with another man's child. But this philosophy helped to get where we are today. After I received Mary Jane's military file, I published it online. Sean McCracken from Mysterious WB also did an episode of his show on her military file and it featured prominently throughout. A civilian sleuth who had been following Mary Jane's case from early on in the investigation went through Mary Jane's military file with fine tooth comb. I wanted to acknowledge her publicly. Um, however, she told me that she wanted to remain anonymous um, so I must respect her wishes. Uh, in early 2023, my civilian sleuth told me to look at page 17 of Mary Jane's military file at the name Percy L. Sebrin. When Mary Jane was promoted to high lift fork operator, she took the position from Mr. Sebrin and he likely trained her. This name was among the dozens of others located throughout Mary Jane's military file but it would be this one alone that would prove crucial. Searching for uh, Mr. Seaburn's history on Finder Grave showed that he died in Kansas City, Missouri on April 14, 1969. It also showed that he married a Mary J. Seaburn, who was born on November 19, 1911, and died on May 31, 1990. Both were buried in New Forest Cemetery in Forest, Louisiana. Early on in the investigation, I ran through a list of find the graves, all the Marys born after November 19, 1911. As you can see, Mary J. Seaburn did appear on my list. However, I never reached her while doing exclusions. I was able to locate uh, Percy's death certificate, um, who showed that he was originally from Louisiana, but that he was run over and killed uh, by a train in 1969. Percy and Mary J. Seaburn had two children, Percy Sr. and Kenneth Seaburn. Percy Lee Seaburn Jr. was born on December 6, 1945, and Kenneth Seaburn was born in 1947. Percy Seaburn Jr. was born nine months after Mary Jane Mangiller left her position at the Wilkins Army Air Force Depot. This was probably the reason for her listing added household duties. Uh, a marriage certificate for Mary Jane and Percy has yet to be located. I could see through Ancestry.com that Kenneth didn't have any children. Well, however, Percy Jr. had four, Jeff, Mary, Aubrey, and Bobby. I reached out to Bobby Seabrand on Facebook and advised her of my investigation. Bobby provided me with the following photographs, showing her grandmother in the late 1970s or early 1980s. She told me that she didn't know much about her grandmother's life and that it was not discussed. Based off the above photographs, I was still unsure if Mary J. Seabrand was Mary J. Van Gilder. 
Bobby did tell me that she would talk to her older siblings to see if they had pictures of their grandmother when she was younger. I had Brian Waters of Moxie Forensic Investigations to do a side-by-side -side comparison and photo enhancement. And this was the result. Additionally, Bobby and her siblings provided a document with Mary Jane's signature. Comparing Mary Jane Van Gogh's signature showed distinct similarities in how each letter was shaped and formatted. Mary J. Seaburn had somehow obtained and was using a different social security number than the one, the one we found in her military file. Jeff, Mary, and Aubrey provided additional photographs of Mary Jane and their grandfather when they were younger, clearly showing that Mary Jane Seaburn was indeed Mary Jane Van uh, That's Mary Jane and Percy there on the left, uh, Mary Jane, Percy, and Kenneth, and Percy Jr. in the middle, and Mary Jane, Kenneth, and Percy there on the right. In December 2023, Mary Seaburn took a DNA test showing her ancestral relation to Anna Rager, Mindy Wilson, and Misty Griner. Mary Jane Seaburn was, without a doubt, Mary Jane Van Gilder. Uh, I would like to thank uh, the following people who have been instrumental in supporting throughout this journey. This list is kind of lengthy, but please bear with me. Uh, Chief Lance Combs from Shelby PD. Uh, Sergeant Aaron Bushy from Shelby PD, Mark Caudill, Lou Whitmer, Zach Tuggle, all from the Mansfield News Journal, Britton Schock from Richland Source, Sean McCracken from Mysterious WB, Mindy Wilson, Mary Jane's granddaughter, Misty James, Mary Jane's granddaughter, Tony Geptos um, from ABC Toledo 13, uh, Pete Elliott, U.S. Marshal out of Cleveland, Jeff Reinick, a retired FBI agent, Anna Mae Rager, Mary Jane's daughter, Jen, Jen Lester from Ohio BCI, Megan Good from the Charlie Project, Bobby Severin, Aubrey Severin, <coughs> Jeff Severin, and Mary Severin, um, all Mary Jane's grandchildren, Ed Denzel from the Unfound Podcast, Dave Blumenloff from the Federal County Coroner's Office, Rodney Creech from the House State Representative, Robin Warder, The Trail Went Cold, John Morden, Lord and Arch Podcast, Paula Schleich, Ohio Mysteries Podcast, Mike Morford, Missing Persons Podcast, Sylvia Pedham, author. CJ Winnig, Angela Hicks, Lisa Croxy, and Kim Rankin, Mary Jane's granddaughters, Angie Alexander, uh, my brother Aaron Turner, Cal Miller, author formerly of the Toronto Star, Lauren Pack of the Butler County Journal News, Barbara Dunn, uh, Kelly Bruce from Missing in Ohio Podcast, Amy Jenkinson from NamUs, uh, Stormy Wood, um, Louise Valentine, Mary Jane's daughter. Um, Louise unfortunately passed away um, about two weeks ago. Um, so I was, uh, I was sad that she, uh, she passed away, but I was happy that we were able to give her some form of closure, even though it's not really closure, but she had the knowledge before she died of where her mother um, was. Uh, Denicia Hinkle, Robert Leeper, Casey Conley, Olivia, Olivia McCarter, Katie Thomas, Brian Waters, and Lennon Ferguson, all of Moxie Forensic Investigations. Kim Neal, Patty Vance, Jane Myers, Jan Myers, Crystal Schaub, Luke Johnson, Mary, uh, Mary Jane's son, James Van Gilder, and the Marion County, West Virginia Genealogical Society. Caspian Smith, Joan Wright, Lee and Anthony Redgrave, Eric Middock, Lisa Foster, Sandra Austin, Amanda Coleman, George Hope Brunner, Melissa Gregory, Melody Josserin, Dr. Amy Michael, Chief Tom Hintz from Plums PD, Margot Warderitz, Everyone in the Missing Mary Jane Van Gilder Facebook group, Alan Fox, the Paramount newspaper, Todd Matthews, um, Todd also unfortunately passed away uh, within a, a month, Daughters of the American Revolution, Sarah Goldenberg from Cleveland 19, and Ashley Madden.
according to her grandchildren, the Sebrins. Mary Jane was the perfect grandmother and described her as incredible. They stated that she loved the garden and her favorite flower was the hydrangea. She liked sun tea and she was a great cook. They stated that she unfortunately died in 1990 from colon cancer and that she was cremated and buried next to Percy in Louisiana because that is where he was originally from. Although she lived the majority of her life after 1945 in Arkansas. Mary Seaburn told me that when Mary Jane was dying, she told her that there was something that she couldn't tell her and that she could never find out. Mary Jane assumed that her grandmother was just talking gibberish, but now it all made sense. As you can imagine, this disclosure has been very painful for Mary Jane's original children and grandchildren. Additionally, additionally the Seaburns also have been experiencing the gamut of emotions because their grandmother never told them who she really was and misled them about her past. What is unknown and what will probably never be known is why Mary Jane decided to leave her family behind in West Virginia and start a new life elsewhere. A family who loved her, cared for her, and missed her for 79 years. What it shows is that our decisions can reverberate through time and distance and affect generations of our immediate family and descendants, and that our choices in life need to be made in the consideration of how it will affect those who love us. Since the beginning, Chief Combs has been very supportive of this investigation. He's hiding in the back there. Uh, he never once uh, questioned uh, my methodologies. Other police chiefs uh, would never have allowed the latitude that Chief Combs permitted me to have. And I cannot thank him enough for that. Consider all the positives that came just from this investigation. Multiple other unknown people were identified. I have personally made friends and connections that will last a lifetime and experiences and memories that will stay with me until the end of my days. While the vast majority of people I've met through this case have been given positive encouragement and support, there were others who were pessimistic and critical. I heard the following phrases multiple times. Why are you working a 79-year-old cold, cold case? Who cares? There's no one left that remembers her. What a race of waste of resources. And the most common, you will never find her. To these people, look at how this room is filled. People that knew and loved her and are here to include her children and grandchildren. There is no case too old. There is no case that is too cold to be worked diligently and thoroughly to include any means necessary. You must never give up, never stop looking, never searching. There is someone somewhere who is missing their relative, no matter how distant. If you are a law enforcement official hearing or reading about this case, please relook at your older cold cases. Replicate some of the tactics we used here specifically public transparency and the exhumations for genetic genealogy. This resolution could not have been accomplished without Mary Jane's family and their support throughout this investigation. They have searched for 79 years to find their mother and grandmother, and I am happy and satisfied that we were able to assist them in ending their quest. Our names represent a fundamental gateway as to who we are and where we came from. Mary Jane's absence less play a hole in her children and grandchildren's lives that was a continuous open wound. Questions will always remain as to why she voluntarily vanished from their lives, but at last the investigation into her disappearance can be and is officially closed. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, I think Mindy's going to come up here and, and speak. You want the microphone? Yes. You can just hold it. Okay. Okay. 
Thank you for everyone being here. Hello everyone and thank you for being here. My name is Mindy Wilson. I am one of many of Mary Jane's grandchildren. This has been a long time coming, excuse me, I may cry, and a long journey. But our family finally has closure. This journey of searching for our grandmother started many years ago before I was ever born with all of her children and her oldest daughter, my Aunt Anna Mae Rager. She has never given up hope on finding her mother of all these 78 years and is so happy to now know what happened to her, as well as all of my grandmother's surviving children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. As my aunt began to grow older, my sister Misty began the journey with her. I, at that time, would occasionally assist, as well as my sister Kim and other family members. They gathered important information over the years, but most led to dead ends. We knew when and where she was last seen and where she worked, and that's pretty much all. When my sister Misty got sick with breast cancer, she handed the reins to me. And this is when I contacted Chief Combs from Shelby, Ohio Police Department on their Facebook page, who eventually handed over the reins to Detective Adam Turner. This is when Grandma was officially reported missing through NamUs, and Adam hit the ground running and has not stopped since. He left no un stone unturned and gathered what information that was pertinent to finding her, as well as giving other missing and not unidentified individuals their names back. I also contacted Mr. Sean McCracken from YouTube's Mysterious West Virginia, and I'm so very happy that he took on Grandma's mystery because he too worked very hard on this journey. I have personally walked the streets that Grandma did on two occasions, once with my husband and Adam, the second time with my sister Kim, and I recently went to Louisiana and visited her final resting place and placed flowers on her grave because I promised God if we ever found her, I would do so. That gives me some type of peace and helps me feel closer to a woman I never knew that I called Grandma. I'm very thankful we were able to deliver the news to her children since that time one of my one of her daughters had recently passed as adam spoke of our aunt louise i'm very glad she had that closure before her death my mother barbara and my aunt judy were not so lucky because they had both left this world some years back i of course cannot come leave out my uncle jimmy whom we all love so very much because he cried tears of joy when we notified him of the news with no judgment I'm not sure why things happened the way they did. All I know is our, fun, our family has closure and hopefully a forever friend in Detective Turner. He's honestly more like family now, like a little brother, pain in the butt. <laughs> it has been a privilege to get to know him. I wanna thank everyone who played a part in this journey, especially Shelby PD, Chief Combs, Detective Turner, Sean McCracken, and to all the, those that done podcasts, wrote articles, our anonymous expert genealogists, family, friends, and our new family. Because without the new family, they may not still know her final resting place. There are so many that has helped and way too many to count. All I can say is thank you to everyone. We can all rest easy now. Our prayers have finally been answered. My grandma, Mary Jane Croft Van Gelder Seabrook. May she rest in peace and as hopefully now reunited in heaven with her children that has passed on. Thank you to everyone for coming and caring about our lost family member who is not lost to us anymore. Also, there was a poem that our genealogist unidentified genealogist <laughs> wrote and it sums up pretty much everything 
I left a wonder for a crowd seemingly forever gone, yet here once lost, now found. My answer coming at a rising dawn from one town to another, leaving a part of myself in one, yet with some looking for their mother, their searches seemingly came up with none. Then came forth a shocking clue, an answer to a prayer, a simple test confirming who no longer any fears to share. Though my future was once a mystery, my resolution is now family history. Thank y'all for coming. Thank you, Mindy. Any questions about anything that we discussed? All right, seeing none. Uh, Where do you go from here, Adam? Where do I go? Yeah. For, forward, I guess. Um, there's always going to be new cases. There's always going to be um, the next thing. Um, I just continue forward and I'll work every case that, you know, as thoroughly and diligently as this one. Um, if anybody watching this uh, has questions about the process, um, exhumations, genetic genealogy, um, or just questions in general about this, uh, feel free to reach out to me. Adam, I have a question. Yes. Is there any thought to collecting DNA from missing persons before they're buried? Is there any way that that can be done so that when these mm -hmm. investigations mm -hmm. happen, there's not a pushback on exhumation? So we're, we're getting better uh, with doing that. Um, it, that wasn't always the case, unfortunately. Um, obviously, we didn't know what DNA could do um, years ago. Um, but now, um, if you have an unidentified person, uh, they, they take DNA. So and I don't know how long they've been doing that. But, uh, you know, the bad thing is that for decades and decades, they were, um, they were just cremating um, unidentified people without taking any DNA. So those people, unfortunately, will remain unidentified. <coughs> All right. Thank you. Oh, one more question. I just have a quick comment real quick. I'm Lance Combs, um, the chief of the Shelby Police Department. The only thing I, this is more for, I think, local officials than anybody else. <coughs> Um, in 1990, we lost our detective bureau due to budget cutbacks. Had not had it through my entire career. Um, when Adam came back, we created that position along with Mayor Shag. Uh, we put one person in it. And the reason that we kind of, well, it wasn't the reason, but one of the reasons why we passed this case on to him was to kind of showcase what we are able to do if we have the resources to do it. And I would also say I deserve no credit for any of this. He deserves all the credit. But this really came at no cost to Shelby City taxpayers. And the reason I say that is um, he funded his trips. So the trips he took out of state, he funded voluntarily. We gave him time to do that. Um, he never asked or presented me with any requests for anything. I think the only thing we paid for was a, a few um, DNA tests to go out. And in the case of Albert Frost, uh, we paid for a portion of his... Uh, a new casket to properly inter his remains. That was very discounted, very much discounted. Most of the cost was borne by Preble County. They did all of that for free. So this was no additional cost. There was no overtime. He did podcasts on his own. He created Facebook pages on his own. And so with the idea, and I took a lot of criticism when we had um, we had some staff issues due to COVID and post-COVID issues. It's hard to find people in law enforcement right now. Um, we, we left him in that position. We did not transition him back into patrol uh, because we, we knew there was value in what he was doing. Did he work on this case while he was working? Yes, yeah, some, but it was more of a hobby and something that he just carried on on his own. So there was, no, there was no additional cost. The reason I bring that up is I would like to see us have the ability to expand that bureau and add some people to that detective bureau because I think the value is shown today in something that took, what, six years? Yes. Uh, and, and we were told very frequently we'd never find her. So kudos to Adam for yeah. doing what he did. Yes. Yeah.
Thank you all for coming. Mayor, do you want to say anything? Thank you. Very much, man. And there you have it. The answer to a mystery that has spanned nearly 80 years. To those people who say it's too old, you'll never find the answer. Who cares? Look how far back it goes. Well, <laughs> this is a family podcast, so I'll keep this uh, as PG-13 as I can. B.S. B.S. The answers are always out there. I would like to thank Detective Turner for bringing me on board virtually at the beginning of this. I've been along for the ride the whole way. And to say that it has been a roller coaster of excitement, highs and lows, clues and drawbacks, and <laughs> half the time we didn't know if we were coming or going. Well, today it's all worth it. We have the answers finally. All right. Thank you all so much. I'm going to conclude the broadcast now. Once again, just like uh, with Preble County, uh, soon, a week or two or three, depending on how long it takes me, uh, I will have up an augmented version of this live broadcast, M multiple angles, even, even better audio, shots of the audience, labels identifying who everyone is and all good stuff like that there so um, and then after that there will be the production of a standard update type feature for once uh well for the first time in a while we have a case which is genuinely 100 percent solved so again thank you to detective turner chief combs and everybody else who has invited me on board for what can only be described as an incredible trip for an independent YouTube, I guess I'm an influencer, although I don't like that term. Anyway, thank you all for tuning into this live broadcast. I will be in touch with you soon. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments. I'll try to get to them. I'll be on the road for the next 36 hours. So thank you all for tuning in. And uh, that's the way it is. Monday, February 12th. 2024. This is Sean McCracken with Mysterious WV. Good afternoon. That was tremendous.